Okay, so I just let uh, admitted, you know, big big powers over here. Um, so more folks, thank you so much for joining us. We are just going to give people um, a couple more minutes, two or three more minutes to get settled, and then we will dive in. loving tribute to our dear sister. Delta Star Wars All right, and just for the other folks who are just joining, I will say it again, and if you got here right in time, this will be your third time hearing it, we're just giving folks another minute or so to get settled um, on your end. Uh, just make yourself comfy, get ready to absorb, you don't need to memorize, we're going to send a recording and all sorts of resources. And I also saw in the, in the chat box that someone says they don't have sound. Unfortunately, if that is the issue, that is an issue on your end as the user, I would double check, of course, um, your speakers and other sound devices. And sometimes when I have that issue, I call in on my phone for the audio part. Okay, so things are slowing down in the waiting room and we're seeing lots of folks join. People are still um, joined as we move along. But with that, let's get started. Let's get into it. I'm going to pass this over to my boss, Selena, to get us kicked off. All right, thank you so much, Jen. Um, can we go to the next slide? So welcome everybody. Um, so happy you have joined us this evening. Um, while we're all getting settled and letting more people in, um, we would love if you would go to the chat and um, put in your name, your pronouns, location, and one thing you are hoping to learn tonight. So my name is Elena Mullins Mains. My pronouns are she, her, hers. I live in Highlands Ranch, and I'm hoping to learn to be a better advocate tonight. And um, can we go to the next slide? Okay. And to this um, wonderful training is being brought to you tonight by your campaigns team at the ACLU of Colorado. And I wanted you to all meet the campaigns team. We have Julian Camera, he's our field organizer. Me, I'm the director of campaigns. Again, my name is Delena. Cassandra Rendon Morales, who is our Reproductive Rights Campaign Coordinator. Jen Samano, our Organizing and Electoral Campaigns Officer. Anna Temu, who could not be with us tonight, but she is our Immigration Campaign Coordinator and she is doing immigration work tonight. And Jessica Howard, who is our Racial Justice Campaign Coordinator. Um, you see Jessica on many, many webinars. So we are letting her have, you know, a little bit of a night off. She's behind the scenes helping us. And we'll go to the next slide. Okay, so just some housekeeping items. Please mute yourself when you're not speaking. Uh, we really want you to participate and to use the chat function. This is being recorded. We want participation and we want questions. So please feel free to ask us anything. Um, we have a couple of people monitoring the chat for questions. Um, as Jen said, we are going to send this recording out and the slides and other resources. And we'll have future trainings on tactics, including Story of Self, which is coming up at the end of the month. And when I'm not speaking, I'm going to put some information in the chat about our Bring Our Neighbors Home web series that Jessica is hosting for us. 
Um, we do have community norms. We want this to be a good space for everyone to learn. So respect and treat others the way they want to be treated. We call that the platinum rule. Um, we all come from different walks of life and we're all at different, you know, points in our, our learning experience. So let's be respectful um, and be respectful of people's backgrounds. Uh, we're not all lawyers. Uh, none of us are lawyers. Jessica's closest. So, um, you know, you know, we we're all going to learn together tonight um, and we all learn differently. So let's let's be respectful of that. And of course, as I modeled earlier, please be respectful and use pronouns. Can we go to the next screen? And I'm not going to read the agenda because it's so boring when people read to you off PowerPoints, but you can see what our agenda is for the night. And, but what is important is our goals. Tonight, we are talking about the importance of state level advocacy, understanding how a bill becomes a law and getting familiar with ways to advocate for legislation. I, I just wanna ask a question before I turn it over. Um, how many of you, and you can, um, I don't know if you guys have the thumbs up reaction things on, on uh, I think you do. But if you have the reactions, give me a thumbs up if you've ever been to an ACLU lobby day. Or you can just write yes in the chat or whatever you want. Great. And of course I have made it so I can't see the reactions. <laughs> Sorry, cool. Um, how about any lobby day? Anybody been to any lobby day? Cool, okay. So we're, um, we're gonna have a lobby day. Uh, it'll be virtual this year. If you've been with us before, um, we've had some interesting things happen on our lobby days. We had a bomb cyclone in 2019 and just a little itty bitty pandemic in 2020. So we're not taking any chances this year. We are, um, we're doing it virtually. So you'll get information about that um, very soon. So can we get the next screen? Oh, yeah, I get to turn it over to Jen to talk to you about the ACLU. Thank you, Dee, um, or Delena. And I also, I forgot to say this when we're all getting settled, um, but also another shout out to Addie, who is a super badass volunteer of ours, who's a high school student, and she is running our slides, so thank you, Addie. And you made our PowerPoint much cuter than it originally was. Okay, so, when we're talking about the ACLU, you know, it's presumable that you all have a sense of us, but we're such a big organization with such, such a big scope of work that before diving in, we'll briefly, briefly review our mission and the structure of the ACLU. Uh, this will give us a better understanding where legislative advocacy fits into the bigger picture. Next slide, please, Addie. Okay, so our mission is to protect and defend civil rights and civil liberties for all people of Colorado. Our organization champions the rights of all people, and we work to ensure that more people are engaged in the political process. You may have noticed the emphasis on all people, and that's intentional. That means regardless of status, documentation, whether you're incarcerated or not, this is for all people. So throughout history, we've expanded our approach to achieving this mission. Um, and most recently, we have built on our litigation and public policy strategies by extending our work out into the community. Now we do community engagement and public advocacy. That's what you and I, that's what we're here doing right now, right? Um, and, you know, doing publicly advo public advocacy has allowed us to reach new heights. Um, we are able to push major policies through to the governor's desk hold local government accountable and win on ballot initiatives because public advocacy work allows us to harness the power of our huge and dedicated member and supporter base. Next slide, please, Eddie. So speaking of that work, um, our litigation policy and advocacy work, let's look at our structure. So we work in three legs. You might think of these as the three legs of the stool. Uh, or the stool, not stools. Uh, so first one is court, that's our legal work. Second one is working at the Capitol or in city halls, that's our public policy making work. And then we have 
community work. That's our advocacy work. Again, that's what we are doing here. And in fact, legislative advocacy work really kind of like fits in between public policy and our, our community advocacy. So all three of these legs of the stool work together. They're interdependent. Um, it's kind of a, this feedback loop that allows us to be such a strong and successful organization. Next slide, please. So public policy making. We say that, but what does that mean? What does that actually look like for us as the ACLU? And for one, that looks like bipartisan work. Uh, all the work we do is bipartisan. And historically, a majority of our state-level bills have had bipartisan sponsorship. Um, our policy team also does a lot of their policy making work through giving feedback from our constitutional perspective. Uh, this takes form in the place of lobbying lawmakers and developing relationships with them and providing expert uh, testimony and other feedback on legislation. Another way that our, or another um, way that our public policy making works at ACLU is creating a bill tracker that lets you know our positions on bills that have to do with civil liberties issues. Uh, they're on your screen, I won't read them, but the one to take note of is active support. If you see that ACLU of Colorado is in active support of something, what that's telling you is that this is one of our priority bills. This is something we're putting a lot of work and resources behind. Um, Okay, next, oh, I'm sorry, just kidding, Addie. There's one more point on here. Legislation, or two more points, sorry. Our positions on legislation can and will change throughout the legislative session. Bills change throughout the legislative session as Delano will show us in how, to, how a bill becomes a law. So that's something to take note of. And then secondly, we all know this too well, legislation can take a long time to pass. Sometimes pieces of legislation are introduced year after year. Um, and why that happens is simply because maybe there's um, competing political priorities, uh, circumstantial and current events. And then a big one reason why we see legislation over and over again is because there's not enough public will or public pressure to pass those bills. Next slide, please. Okay, so we're going to pause to just define what we mean when we keep saying legislative advocacy, which there's lots of context clues, but let's get specific. Um, we're talking about uh, we're talking about harnessing constituent power um, and community and, and using that power of constituents and communities with shared values to influence legislative outcomes, right? So basically using public pressure and shared values to defeat or pass proposed legislation. Um, and another thing to mention here is how we say power, what are we talking about? Power can be almost a controversial word, right? But it shouldn't be. We should take ownership of it because power is neutral. It just means our ability to affect the course of events. Um, so, of course, we're here to affect legislative outcome, but um, a more innocuous example of power is that my cat has a lot of power. Every night, she, or every day, all day, she affects the course of events in my life. If she decides to take a nap on my lap, then I will not be having lunch for another 30 minutes. Next slide, please. Let's also get specific about what we mean when we say advocate. This one's extra simple. An advocate is someone who publicly supports a particular policy or cause. So, that's probably been a lot of you in your life, right? Even if you never formally thought of yourself as an advocate. Um, and of course, if we're, if we're engaging in the public policy making process, then you know, we're doing advocacy. We're coming out with what we believe and in, in, in sharing our values. So if you would like to share in the chat any times that you have been an advocate in your community, whatever comes to mind is cool. Because really, when you think about it in this framework, you've probably been an advocate. Next slide, please. Okay, so here uh, we'll take a super brief look at our legislative priorities, meaning taking a look at the bills we are actually trying to pass, so the specifics of what we're trying to get done this year. So we have over one dozen bills that are active support or our priority bills. 
They are represented mostly on your screen. There might be a couple that aren't in there. Um, but literally in this slide, all we're going to do is look because we have an extensive library of recordings that go deeper into these issues. And plus, we did a legislative preview event earlier this month, which we also have a recording of. In said event, our public policy director, Denise Maez, goes through each bill individually in greater depth. And then plus, looking ahead into the future on the calendar, throughout all of legislative session and throughout the entire year, um, we as ACLU of Colorado will continue to offer lots and lots of educational webinars. These webinars take deeper, ish, deeper looks into issues, uh, their intersections, and their associated policies. So, um, we will link to all those aforementioned recordings and such in, your, in the follow-up email that we will send. So again, you can see there's a lot of really exciting things um, on the horizon for us. And um, now that we have a clearer picture of our organization and a taste of the specific change-making bills we are fighting for this year, let's take a look at the playing field, um, otherwise known as the lay of the land. Next slide. The lay of the land simply means the conditions or the truth or, or the facts of the situation. So this is the information that you use to inform your strategy and planning, and the information that is really valuable before you start to take action. So a couple of examples come to mind. One is we've all been doing lay of the land when we leave our houses in a pandemic. What are the situations? Who, who am I going to see next? What are rates like now? Um, all, all of those things. And another example that I can't get out of my head is young people, right? You have to sneak around, or you might have to sneak around a lot. For example, I may or may not have snuck into a lot of concerts. That requires a lot of lay of the land, of seeing what's before you before taking action. Next slide, please. Okay, so on this slide, you have a pyramid that shows the different levels of government. I find this pyramid really, really helpful, um, even though I do this work all the time, to really make a distinction between the different levels of government, which also inform us as to where we're doing work, makes it more clear for us. We are at the green band. That's where we're at. We're doing state-level advocacy. We're doing advocacy at the state legislature. Obviously, or maybe not obviously, on that green band, or that, that isn't our state. Um, if you can name what state that is, you will get a gold star. Just kidding. But if you do know that state, that would be interesting. Um, I digress. Back to levels of government and why they're important. Um, it's important to distinguish where you're doing your work. But it's also important um, because state-level advocacy is an extremely effective way of creating change, and it's really tangible in our lives. Um, what is passed on the state level, you're more likely to feel um, in your personal life. And plus, working, doing uh, policy work on the state level, affecting change on the state level provide, um, can help set trends on the federal level and, and push policy in that way, and plus, it also works below into that purple level of local advocacy in, in creating precedent and putting in protection. So if you're like, I don't know where to start, state level advocacy is a really, really great way to make tangible change. Next slide, please. Okay, so let's also, in this lay of the land section, talk about the three branches of government. Um, so. We have the executive branch, carries out laws, legislative branch, which makes the actual laws, and then the judicial branch, which evaluates the laws, which is why you'll often hear in court, ruling, court rulings, you know, we don't make the law, we just evaluate it. You know, and when you hear that, you can think, oh, three branches of government. So again, we have executive, legislative, and judicial. They all deal with the law in different ways, and the, the framework or fabric that unites these three branches is the Constitution. And to make it extra clear, let's look at the executive branch at the federal or national level versus the state level. And we know some of these characters, right? So on the executive level, the U.S., President Biden, plus his cabinet members, like 
uh, Vice President Harris. Now the equivalent to the state level would be Governor Polis plus his cabinet members like Secretary Griswold or Attorney General Phil Weiser. Moving to the legislative branch, um, some examples of uh, U.S. figures are, of course, Representative Pelosi from the House, and then Senator McConnell, and Colorado's very own Representative Joe Nacuse, who um, was in the spotlight of a lot around the latest impeachment here. On the state level, some popular lawmakers, at least for us, and the work, issues we work on are Representative Herod and Senator Julie Gonzalez. Judicial, um, on the U.S. or national level, of course, the Supreme Court. And then on the state level, we have our own Colorado Supreme Court. Again, it's helpful to keep separating these out because when we are consuming all sorts of different information, these distinguishments aren't made for us. By continually practicing separating these out, we are going to be more effective in our advocacy. Next slide, please. Okay, so we're going to zoom down even more and look at Colorado's legislative branch, aka our General Assembly, aka our state legislature, aka a state house. You will hear all these used interchangeably. So we have two chambers. Um, we have our state senate and our state house. Um, and we have a majority, um, or not we, but there is a majority of um, Democrats in the Senate chamber and the House chamber and in the executive branch um, through Governor Polis. And so that's why you might hear people say there's a Democratic trifecta. So um, this was a really big deal when it first happened in 2018. Uh, it was the first time this had happened since like the, the 30s. However, the thing is, <laughs> The political lay of the land will change all the time, but the one thing, no matter what the political lay of the land is, the one thing that remains the same in terms of strategy is that public advocacy is essential. So even if you think your legislator is progressive and would align with your, your world view, it doesn't matter. They still need to see, feel, and hear the public will to know um, that they are supported and being progressive, or to know that their constituency is still wanting those things. Next slide, please. So basically, don't don't let that make you think you can take your guard down. I hate to say. Um, okay. Final part of Colorado's lay of the land. Constituents. That's you and I. Constituents just means people who live in a district, right? Who are being represented. So broadly speaking, when we're looking at Colorado, um, although it seems that we are moving towards the left side of the political ideological spectrum. Um, in terms of party identity, the majority of Coloradans are unaffiliated. This also reflects national trends to move away from this party identification. The point in that, besides just getting us more familiar with our political ideological culture, is that you really can't simplify state level politics with you know, one party versus the other. Normally, we see, uh, normally, a uh, legislative session convenes for 100 in up to 120 days. The point is, in, in giving that figure, is that legislative session is, for a relatively short period of time, it's very fast paced and it requires that we are very uh, able to be rapid response as the public as things change quickly and overnight. Um, the other thing that goes on almost all presentations or all considerations is COVID. Um, COVID, depending on what happens, could change uh, the flow and the schedule of legislative session, and it can also affect the way we're able to interact and go to the physical capital. On the flip side, which we've seen over and over again, COVID has also allowed for more accessibility. There are a ton of ways to virtually participate um, in the legislative process, which, of course, we will get into. Okay. So now we have an idea of the lay of the land. I will give it to Delena to go over how a bill is going to walk. Okay. Thanks, Jen. That was great. Um, so how a bill becomes a law. Bills always start off as ideas, don't they? Um, let's go to the next uh, slide. So just to go back over something Jen said, um, the General Assembly consists of um, 
35 senators, 65 representatives. Those senators serve four-year terms. The representatives serve two-year terms. And um, so that's very different from the federal level, but all members are limited to serving eight consecutive years in their chamber, which is also uh, very different from the federal level. So four terms for representatives and two terms for senators. Um, I know a lot of you would love to hear that there were term, term limits at the federal level, but we have them in Colorado, but not at the federal level. Can we go to the next slide? Um, and just like we all sat and watched in Georgia to see those two seats, how they would go, because we were concerned about the leadership in the federal Senate. In Colorado, as you can see, uh, the leadership's pretty pronounced given you know, the large um, caucus of uh, the Democrats have, but leadership is the president of the Senate, the speaker of the house and the majority and minority leaders of each chamber. They take care of the day-to-day -day operations, deal with disputes, maybe disputes about members, um, but the president of the Senate and the Speaker of the House, they control the committees, who gets uh, assigned to those committees, which bills get assigned to those committees, even the sizes of those committees in some cases. So leadership is important. Whoever is, you know, has the most members kind of controls everything. So you'll see throughout the year that we talk a lot about kill committees. Um, there's a committee every session that where bills go to die. And up until 2018, the Republicans in the Senate had a committee where, you know, Democratic bills went to die. And that's just how it was. And I'm sure that the Democrats have that committee in both, how, um, both chambers now. Can we go to the next? Um, thank you. So just so we all know, in the House of Representatives, Speaker of the House is Alec Garnett, Majority Leader is Denea Eskar, and the Minority Leader is Hugh McKean. And I hope I said that right. And again, you can see the partisan breakdown that Jen discussed before. Next slide. And in the Senate, the President is Leroy Garcia. Majority Leader is Steve Fenberg. Minority Leader is Chris Holbert, my Senator. And again, you can see the partisan breakdown. And we'll go to the next slide. So if you are a child of the 70s like myself, you remember this guy, Bill. He had a whole song. It was really hard for him to get up those steps to become a law, to even get into that building. So Bill says he starts as just an idea. He's, you know, somebody has an idea, maybe you have an idea and you call up your representative or go see him and say, hey, I have this great idea. I think it should be a law. And what they do is if they agree with you, they go to a uh, drafter in the, in the General Assembly. And I saw somebody in the chat saying they were taking a drafting class for a law student. Um, so there are people whose whole job it is to draft the bills that um, we work on in the assembly. And all those bills looked the same. They, they you know, if you go and Cassandra's gonna show you how to go onto the website every bill looks the same. It has a number, it has sponsors, it has um, the same basic parts every time. So they draft that bill and then they use some of their very precious introduction um, resources because they can't, each member is limited in the number of bills they can introduce. So, you know, they don't have, um, I think they start off at five and then maybe make special exceptions beyond that. But so, you know, they have to be on board to put this, introduce this bill, ask this bill to be read across the desk. And we'll go to the next slide now. And this is um, how a bill becomes a law. So once we get that bill drafted, we get it on paper, it's read across the desk, that's considered the first reading. And then it is immediately um, assigned to a committee by either the Speaker of the House or the President of the Senate. And then it goes to that committee. This is you know, where the committee, um, the committees are where the work is done. And this is where you really can make a difference. Um, almost everybody on this campaign's team has 
testified before a committee. It is an interesting experience and I highly suggest you do it. And it's much more accessible right now than having to go down there and sit all day and that building's really hot. I don't understand. I think the taxpayers of Colorado could be saved some money if they just turned down the heat. But so, you know, really take advantage of um, the very little silver lining that is COVID. So it goes to a committee, they have a hearing, say they vote it out of the committee. Maybe it has to go to another committee. And then it goes, if all goes well, I mean, this is a lot. Like I said, it takes a little bill, a hard time walking up those steps to get to be a law. If all goes well, it goes back to the chamber. So this is the committee of whole. This is everybody in that chamber. So bill starts in the house, goes to house committees, comes back to the house chamber. The second reading, they can put more amendments on and then they can vote on that. And then it goes to a third reading, which is supposed to be less amendments, less debate. I don't know if it always works that way, but this is also where the recorded vote happens. So this is the vote where you can see that your senator or representative did or did not vote on something you care about. And we hope that you will hold them accountable or thank them when they do vote or don't vote the way you want. So then it, if it goes through third readings and it gets out, then it goes to the other chamber. So again, if it starts in the House, it has to redo this whole process again in the Senate. And then if it gets out of the Senate, let's just hope that that bill didn't have any changes, but that never happens really. So then it might have to go through reconciliation where they convene a committee to reckon, um, a conference committee to reconcile the bill. Or sometimes maybe the original prime sponsor will just say, I'm fine with those amendments and ask their um, chamber to vote on the amendments as is. Or maybe they'll just say, nope, I want my bill to be exactly the way I wrote it. And then it's unfortunately gonna die right there. So once it gets done with that process, which can take the entire legislative session as it did with our sex ed bill in um, 2019, I believe, it goes to the governor. I mean, there's a few procedural steps in there, but it goes to the governor. He can either sign it, he can veto it, or he can do nothing. If he does nothing, 10 days later, when we are in session, it becomes law. If we are not in session, it's 30 days and it becomes law. If he vetoes it, it has to go back and be passed by two thirds. So that's how a bill becomes a law. And if you think I'm super smart and I know all this because I'm super smart, you're wrong, I'm not. Um, I found this out on the Colorado General Assembly website, which is an amazing wealth of knowledge. And Cassandra Lyndon Morales, our reproductive rights campaign coordinator is going to show you how you can become super smart like me. Thank you so much, Delina. Um, so now that Delina has, you know, walked you through the whole process on how a bill becomes a law, like every time I go through that document, like, it's like, oh my God, it's like the first time I'm looking at it again, because there are so many steps. Um, but now I'm going to walk you through on how to follow the legislative process from the comfort of your own home. And I saw a comment in the chat on if you're going to get access to this PowerPoint um, after this webinar and you will, so you'll have access um, to all of the information that we're sharing with you tonight. Next slide, please. Awesome. So first, we're going to start by locating um, the Colorado legislative website. Um, you can go into your Google, um, your Yahoo, your Bing, um, and just put in Colorado General Assembly. Once you put in the Colorado General Assembly, you're going to see it pop up. And you want to make sure you're using, you want to make sure you click on the URL that says ledge.colorado.gov forward slash. Once you're there, just save it, just bookmark it. Um, this is going to be where you're going to be able to find everything. Okay, next slide, please. Awesome. So once you click on this link, you're going to see a bunch of places to access information. Um, if you look at the top, you have your session schedule, you have bills, you have laws, you have legislators, committees. So really, 
there are going to be lots of ways to, to search for the information that you're looking for. Um, so just be mindful of that. Um, but tonight, I really want to just narrow um, in um, in the four things that I've selected in the green box below. So how to find your legislator, how to watch and listen um, from the safety of your own home, how to find a bill if you're looking for a bill, and then um, how, how you can learn about the state budget. Next slide, please. Awesome. So first, I'm going to walk you um, through on how to find your legislator. Next slide, please. So if you look up here on the top left, you see find my legislator. So really what the text says underneath that you have to have a street address, um, street address, city, make sure you put in the correct zip code because if you don't put in the correct zip code, sometimes it can take you to like different legislators. So um, we're gonna put in an address and I'm gonna show you what it looks like. So next slide, please. One more time. Sweet. So where the arrow was showing before, there's a little box to the left. You put in your address. We use the ACLU address for this one. Um, and my senator and representative popped up. This is also such a nifty little thing to do because it pops up their email and it also pops up their web page in case you want to contact them directly. Um, in case you want to set up a meeting with them, yes, you can set up a meeting with them. Um, even if, you know, even if we're in a virtual world, you can still have a virtual meeting. Um, this is super helpful for lobby days, right? Many of you have gone to lobby days um, or sometimes you move and you're like, oh wait, you know, my legislators um, changed. So you can always go here. This will always be here um, and it should be accurate. If it's not accurate, you're like, that doesn't look right. Just double check that, um, double check that address, double check, double check that zip code. Next slide, please. Sweet. So now we're going to focus in the watch and listen portion. So like I mentioned, um, you're going to be able to watch and listen to anything that's happening at the at the legislator during legislative session um, from the comfort of your own home. Next slide. So watch and listen. So under live legislative video, it says watch live video via the Colorado Channel site. So this is going to be actual video. Um, once you click on that site, it'll take you to any live um, video that they have going on at the Capitol, whether that's whether they're debating a bill on the floor, whether they're having um, something being heard in committee, it'll just automatically show you what's live. Um, and then they'll save pre-recorded videos from maybe, you know, earlier this week or last night or this morning that'll be up there. Um, it'll take you to the Colorado Channel site, but it'll, but there's also, a, the Colorado Channel site also has a page on YouTube. So you can also look it up that way in case, you know, you're YouTube savvy and that's what you prefer and you want to follow them just to be updated. Um, if you're like, I don't want to listen to the video I'm driving or actually I just want to pop it up on my phone. I don't even want to access it through a computer. You can click on the live legislative audio and that will just pop up a web player um, either on your phone, your tablet, or your browser, and you can click play, and then you can hear that audio. Um, so those are two um, safe ways for you to watch and listen um, to the legislative session from the comfort of your own home. Next slide, please. Sweet. So I love this. So it's find a bill. Um, you can, how do you find videos for old sessions? Um, I would say, I don't know specifically because I haven't researched old sessions, but it's a really good question. I would say just um, click on that page and then click and then just see if there are videos and audios for um, earlier sessions, but everything's documented. I just don't know how far long they keep those videos up there, but that's a great question. So for the find a bill, um, if a bill is introduced, you can search it and you can read like the raw, like 20, 30 pages um, of this bill. So you can read um, line for line. Um, next slide, please. Sweet, so at the top left where you see that green arrow, um, it says search for a bill. So it says HB 17 dash, you know, 100. That's a very specific way of searching for a bill. Let's say you know that specific um, that specific number for the bill. 
And then if you don't, that's okay. Um, you can look up the sponsor if you know the sponsor of the bill, bill, or maybe you're like, actually, I think this bill has to do with like immigration. It has to do with like sex education. You can type that in as a keyword and it'll generate um, any, any of the bills that have been introduced or maybe past bills that were introduced um, that have that keyword. Um, for bills, resolutions, and memorials, uh, memorials, if you see underneath, it says most access bills. So this is going to be all of the bills that have been um, highly like researched, maybe in the last you know, amount of time. So if you click see all bills, it'll give you kind of all of the bills that have been you know, popular, have been researched, or you can browse by subject. Um, if you're just you know, a nerd, like most of us on this call, and you just wanna read, um, you can browse by the subject and then you can just read through some of the other bills and that's gonna be further down the page. You can see it here on the top right. So next slide, please. So this section right here was actually new for me. Um, I had never clicked through this section, but it's explore the budget. So I'm gonna walk you through what that is. Next slide. So this section was really, um, it's very valuable um, if you want to understand how the state legislature determines the state budget. So if you click through here, um, you'll learn budget basics, you'll learn how big the state budget is, um, you'll explore the state budget by just kind of reading, you know, all the details of it, um, you'll learn about the state revenue, um, you'll also learn about TABOR, which is super, super helpful because that's you know, that's always in the topic as the topic of conversation, so especially folks who have just moved here, people who like don't agree with it, etc. So it talks about Tabor, and then there's just a bunch of other readings on there as well. Next slide, please. So if you're like, the website is cool, um, I, I feel good about it, but also more of like a social media person, that's okay because uh, the House has its own Twitter. And then the Senate has its own Twitter as well. So um, this means that you can follow along via social media. These Twitter accounts are run by either like legislative aides or someone that is, you know, is a staffer at the Capitol. Um, so this isn't just like a random person tweeting. This is like actual valid, correct information. And they're always tweeting, always sending up messages. So if you're following a bill, um, it will definitely probably pop up there. If you're following a bill and you know who the sponsor is, my recommendation would be to follow those sponsors because they're going to be talking about those bills. Um, all of your legislators, well, most of your legislators have social media accounts, whether that's Instagram, Twitter, or Facebook. So I would recommend looking them up and then just following them and or following the folks who's, who are sponsoring the bills that you are advocating for, for the legislative session. And then you have the coloradochannel.net there again. And so, no, it's okay, <laughs> no worries. Um, and again, that's just where you can watch the video of, of the legislative session. And I'll pass it over to Julian, who's going to walk you through on how to advocate. Thank you, Cass. Um, and that was all really helpful information for me because sometimes I just don't know where to find a bill and it drives me crazy. Um, but anyways, good evening, everyone. I'm Julian Camera. My pronouns are he, him, his, and I'm the field organizer with the ACLU of Colorado. Um, I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about uh, how, to, how to advocate. Um, so we can go to the next slide. Um, now that we have, now that we know how to track bills, locate our legislators, find out who belongs to what committees, what are the ways we can advocate effectively to our legislators on the issues we care about? Um, one thing that's underrated, and I'm sure you've heard this time and time before, but I have to reiterate it. Um, it's the power that you have as a, as a constituent. You know, elected officials, they were voted into office by constituents, and therefore they hold their title as an elected official to represent the wants and needs of their constituents. Um, so, you know, you may have gotten an email from an organization asking you to use a form to email your legislator or to make a phone call, you know, or you may have gotten thousands of emails like that if you're if you're like me and you sign up for every organization possible. But it might have crossed your mind, will my phone call really make a difference or will my signature on this petition really count? Um, the answer is yes, because what happens is whether it's a strategic direct action effort 
or a rapid response or a lobby day. Um, when a legislator gets a number of people contacting them about an issue, they know that these are the people who have the power to vote for or against them during their reelection. And they also know that if the direct action builds enough movement, um, the media will catch on and start to cover the issue and in turn, business owners, uh, influential leaders, and others will all start to also start to catch on and they'll need to address the issue um, immediately. So a great example of this was over the summer following the murders of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and the, uh, uh, the murder of Elijah McClain by police. Um, people throughout our state took to the streets to march and demand that we abandon the current form of policing that was you know, built off of white supremacy and, and was created to target black and brown individuals. So in turn, um, with thousands and thousands of people and national media attention across the country, um, a bill called SB 217 was introduced to modify the deadly use of force standards, uh, collect data on officers' encounters with the public based on race, require an officer to intervene when another officer is acting inappropriately, prohibit chokeholds, um, and wear body cameras at all times. Um, the bill went through committees very quickly. By June 19th, the governor had signed the bill. You know, as Delana mentioned earlier, usually it takes, it can take years, maybe Jen mentioned, but it can take years, uh, it could take months. This bill happened within a month, which was not normal, but this was a great example of a strategic direct action and lobbying, um, you know, combination of the two where parties from all, parties from all across the state, they worked together to demand this change and legislators acted very quickly to make this bill become a law because they knew this is what the public wanted, this is what their constituents wanted. Um, Yes, and, and qualified immunity. Thank you so much, Michael. Um, and we're also, just a note for that bill, we're also um, adding some um, great amendments to that bill this legislative session. So keep an eye out for that. Um, and you can track it in the bill tracker that Cass just showed. So next slide, please. Um, so what are the ways in which you can contact, connect with your legislator to move them on an issue in an effective way. You know, you wanna make sure that you're putting your time into a strategic effort that's impactful um, and that you're helping build power in, in, in a particular movement. So the first thing is lobbying. Um, and this is gonna be different than direct action because it's more about building a relationship with a particular legislator and having a targeted conversation about a specific policy or issue. So, you know, lobbying means different things in different states, but Colorado in particular, it means communicating directly or soliciting others to communicate with an elected official for the purpose of aiding in or influencing the drafting, the passage, the defeat, approval, or veto by an elected official on a legislative matter. Cass just showed you the budgeting process. That is a perfect example of a, an opportunity where you would want to lobby a, a, um, a legislator. Um, and one way this is done is through professional lobbyists. So the ACLU of Colorado, we have a wonderful lobbyist. Her name is Ann Burgess. And she works directly with our public policy director, Denise Myers, um, and, and, and they both work with members from our state legislator to draft and create policies. You know, her job is to have targeted conversations with these legislatures, legislators and um, about the makeup of the bill and who's going to sponsor it and how we can strategically make sure it passes. Um, another, more on the constituent end, is uh, to visit your legislator at their office or reach out to them directly to lobby them on an issue you care about. Um, you can also join an organizational lobby day. I know I saw a bunch of you who joined our lobby day um, in previous years or have joined another lobby day. Um, so that's a that's a great way. Um, you know, you so usually for those of you who don't know, a lobby day con, uh, constituents. You know, you gather at the Capitol um, on a particular day that's organized by a person or organization, um, and you lobby your legislators on bills that you would like them to support or oppose. Um, it's a great opportunity to have that face-to-face, one-on-one conversation with them or their aides, um, while also flexing your strength in numbers. You know, I think it was like last year or the year before, um, <laughs> our public policy director got word that legislators were like, great, the ACLU lob lobby, it's ACLU lobby day, they're here, you know, so that we have, we have a little bit of a reputation for, for our lobby day, which is great because they know we're coming to their offices, we're gonna have those conversations with them, those strategic professional conversations. Um, 
Other ways you can move your legislators come in the form of direct action and contact, um, direct contact and action. Um, so this is similar, but different because it focuses on building power in numbers. And it's more about accountability and influencing a legislator to vote a certain way. So at any point in the year, you can contact your legislator by email, by phone. You can at them on Twitter, on social media, which is great because it's public. The media can see all of that. Um, you can create a petition. You can write a postcard or a letter. Uh, you can testify at a hearing. Um, and that's key because Colorado is really unique um, because individuals in our state, we have the legal right to testify at any committee hearing. And this is really cool because it means legislators have to see your face and hear your story. Um, we're going to get into storytelling in a moment here. But basically, if you sign up to testify, legislators have, and they're in a particular committee, they have to stay and hear your testimony, no matter if it's one in the morning, which is true. It really happens. People stay until like one, two in the morning testifying um, because you have that legal right to, to, to have your voice heard. Um, and, and, and just to add, with testifying um, on a bill, you'll, you'll want to like keep track of the bill's that you're interested in. Um, I think Alice asked about, do we get to choose the bills that we want to work on? Of course you get, you get to choose the bills that you care about. Absolutely. Like that is, um, that is you're, you're a constituent. You get to choose what issues um, hit, you know, touch your heart and what you want to put your efforts into. Um, for ACLU, we have a set number of bills that we commit to supporting and a set number of bills that we can commit to like running and, and putting all our efforts behind. So, um, we usually stick to those bills and sometimes things come up and um, anyway, so you, if you want to testify, the key is to track the bill and know when it's going into a particular committee and then you can show up um, at, uh, virtually and sign up to testify. Um, with direct contact, you're basically strengthening the case that constituents really care about a particular issue um, and are not willing to forget how a legislator voted on that issue whether that's thanking them like, whoa, this legislator really support this issue I cared about. I'm gonna remember that when they come up for re-election, I'm gonna advocate for them. Or they never listen to you, they never listen to their constituents. That's a terrible rep to have, especially if you're, if you're a legislator and you're trying to move up um, in, in, the, in, the, uh, you know, in the elected, in, in government, if you're trying to move up in government and wanna to go to Congress, you wanna eventually become president. If you have a reputation that you didn't listen to your constituents, that's not good. Um, so, and, and whether they show or not, legislators do care how many times they're contacted by their constituents. Um, next slide, please. So to make your advocacy impactful, uh, you'll wanna consider a few things. One, um, storytelling. You know, everyone has a story, whether you're connected to a specific issue from a parent, a sibling, a friend, an experience, that you happen or you're directly impacted um, because of your identity, your race, your ability, um, you're gonna have a story. Um, and knowing how to tell your story is super important um, when, you're, when you're trying to push legislators or push anyone to, to create better change. Um, so we'll dive into that in a minute. But next, if you're looking to have numbers, uh, yeah, you know, if your goal is to have your voice heard in large numbers, you'll want to do some strategy planning and ask yourself some questions. You'll want to ask yourself first, who are my people? Does this policy impact students, workers, reproductive rights, um, those experiencing homelessness, people of color, et cetera? You know, depending on who your people are, depends on how you might go about organizing them. You know, if you're trying to rally your classmates, you might schedule an after school meeting to discuss your plans for action. Um, and one thing that you can always do is search for community organizations who might also care about this issue and ask them how you can team up. You know, us on the campaign team, we always want to hear if there's a particular civil rights, civil liberties issue that you heard about that you know that you might want to that you might want to partner with us on or that should be on our radar. You know, definitely let us know. Um, next, you know, what form of communication is going to be most effective for this particular legislator and this issue? Using social media to put a legislator on bat on blast might not be effective if they don't use social media or you know it, it it might not be effective if you're trying to get them to work with you on the issue um so ask yourself you know what tactic will be most effective what how will i reach my target 
what will be most accessible for my people. You know, some people might not be able to send an email, but they would be able to show up to a committee hearing to testify. What's going to drive the most people and the most movement um, behind your action? You know, if you have time, say you know that a bill is coming next year, you may want to put more time and thought into it. You know, my wonderful colleague, uh, Helen Griffiths, you know, she collected thousands of postcards before the death penalty bill was introduced last year. Maybe a few of you signed a postcard. Um, but once it was introduced, you know, she had already collected thousands and thousands. She, all she had to do was mail them to the legislators. So sometimes you want to take a step back, even if you're feeling urgent in the issue, you're like, let me, let me take a step back and think about what's going to be the most strategic and how am I going to get to where I need to go? Um, so like I said, take a, um, think about where you want to be, you know, um, it, it's, it's just important to be strategic and plan out every move, um, visualize your end goal and then, and then choose the route that you want to go to get there. Um, so next slide, please. Um, one uh, story of self, I, I kind of jumped into that. Um, like I said, all of us have a story. So when I was, you know, so full disclosure, I'm transgender. And when I was, you know, 13, 14, 15, when I was I mean, basically under the age of 18, you know, going through puberty, going through all the changes, I was really, I had a, I had a hard time. I you know, acted out, I ran away, like all these things. Um, I won't, I'll spare you the details, but it was, I had a hard time. And um, basically I just didn't, you know, I saw therapists, I talked to my parents, like I, no one I knew had the tools to talk to me about what it could mean to be transgender. Um, not doctors, and like I said, not therapists, no one had those tools. Um, fast forward to, few years ago, last year, um, a bill was introduced into the Colorado State Legislature to criminalize providing gender affirming care to um, those who are under the age of 18. Now, this was, uh, this immediately like freaked me out and got me really upset because, you know, had, I always think, you know, had I had access to resources when I was going through puberty, my life would have turned out much differently. And I, you know, I, I, I know that like I'm able to express that now because of the experience I went through. Um, but I don't think anyone should have to go through that to have to, to be able, to, no one should have to go through that um, and then be expected to advocate um, when terrible, hateful, discriminatory bills come up. Um, it just shouldn't be that way. People should just be able to go through and live life um, in the body, in the mind of their choice. Um, and so anyway, so crim this law, it would criminalize it would make it a crime for a doctor to tell a kid, you have um, gender dysphoria. I'm gonna suggest you go to a therapist. I'm gonna suggest potentially hormone replacement therapy. Your therapist can decide that and we'll work together to decide what's what's best for you. Um, it would make that a crime. And basically that'd be like saying to a kid, you don't get your medicine that helps you wake up and get, go to school every day um, because I wanna control your body. So anyways, I went and I testified at this hearing and um, sure enough, so did 30 other people. We were there until two in the morning um, and the legislators, like five out of, I wanna say seven of them, they spoke out and they said, you know, thank you so much for sharing your story. This, this bill will not make it past this room. It's dying right now. Um, and that was that. So sometimes people don't know, um, you have to make, you have to, you don't have to, but you can use your story to make things apparent to um, to lawmakers that they wouldn't normally know or see. Um, but Jen's going to dive a little bit more deeper into developing the story of self, and we want to continue this training because it's so important, and um, and we want to share those tools with you. Uh, thank you, Jen. Awesome. Thank you, Julian, and thank you for sharing that um with all of us so what Julian just demonstrated for us is really the secret sauce to making the work work right so through all those tactics he went through um he would all the tactics that Julian went through will be completely boosted by a, a lot of degrees if if and when we develop our stories of self and what what does that mean what is this piece of jargon now it simply means that what is the story of the why and of the how 
um, that got you into doing this work? Because not everybody decides to take concrete action and engage in the political process, let alone take time out of their personal lives to be in this training and, and continue to do this work with us, right? That's unique. Um, and so everybody who makes that decision has a story as to why. It just might take some time and some effort to see what that story is. And so we're going to begin some of the work of figuring out our story today. But this is just to get your wheels turning. Um, because in the last week of March, as has been mentioned, we are going to offer a couple of training sessions to take a deeper dive into how to create and craft this story of self and the many strategic ways to use the story of self. Next slide, please, Addie. But again, we're going to use this space to just start to get the wheels turning, get our toes wet on story of self and the many, many ways that we use story of ourselves in, in public advocacy work, and especially legislative advocacy. Okay, so it's important to share your story because a, storytelling is as old as human civilization, and B, storytelling is emotive, right? And emotions drive us to action. In other words, driving people to action, whether that the people we're referencing is a friend or a lawmaker, it first takes the heart, then the head, and then the hands, or then the action. So it's first you have to move people to action, then get their minds seeing the factual and strategic aspects and then taking action, going to the, for example, going to the Capitol. Um, and so making the story come alive, um, and actually I'm going to pause, that's, that's the point I was forgetting, is that um, it is often you'll actually hear, I know just from doing this work, is that um, your lawmakers and legislat legislators are looking for those stories from their constituents. Um, so they are really strategic and important. Okay, so um, it's really important to make sure your story comes alive. So we're going to go just briefly over a couple of key components um, of your story itself. And you'll notice they're the same as any other good story, right? So the character, you, um, faces a challenge like Jewel has described for us. Then the character makes a choice. Finally, the character experience is the outcome of their choice. So as you can see, this is clearly a story that we are crafting and not a thesis or a fact sheet. Um, stories are what breathes life into and make facts compelling to act on. And I say this as someone who loves reading peer-reviewed uh, peer journal articles um, and loves, loves, loves dense facts. But if I'm trying to advocate to lawmakers or friends, I lean on the stories, right? Um, so it's also really important in crafting your story of self to make this story authentic. Your story of self isn't about who has the most traumatic or dramatic story. Um, and even if you do have a really intense story as to why you're involved, you have to ask yourself and honor yourself, am I ready to share that, right? No one's pushing you to do something you're not ready. In other words, it takes a lot of self-reflection reflection to develop this. And I also think that for folks who are not directly impacted by an issue, so often white folks and or upper middle class to wealthier folks can kind of have a hard time with starting this exercise, being like, well, I'm not directly impacted, so I don't really have a story, right? You know, you could be someone who is really in favor of criminal legal reform, and then you're presented with these, these probes and you're like, well, you know, I've never been incarcerated, not even anyone in my family has really been incarcerated. I don't work in the courts, you know, I don't think I really have a why as to I'm doing this. I will tell you, you're wrong. You do, and it just takes some work to figure out what is your specific why as a person, because everyone has one. Next slide, please. Thank you, Addie. Okay, so um, now that I've, like, dumped this existential crisis on you, uh, but here are some probing questions to help you kind of find your own story of self. And again, this is just to get you familiar, um, and we're sending these slides, you can kind of do this, this work on your own, um, and of course we will do the deeper work in our upcoming training. But these questions are super helpful, um, and I do want to highlight a couple of things, is as our awesome colleague Anna calls it, 
you know, just calling the why, what was the moment that made you get involved in this work, in this political advocacy process as your spider bite moment? It's a Spider-Man reference that even I get. So, like, what was that big, big thing that made it, that, that drove you to act, to action? The other thing I'll just briefly, yes, the size will, slides are being sent out afterward, for sure. Um, the other thing I want to highlight on this slide of reflective questions is, like, it's super important to make sure that you're showing your story rather than just telling, right? Because again, we're, we're doing stories. So here is um, a rough example. Let's say I am really passionate about um, health justice and making healthcare affordable. I'm doing reflective work and I realize, I'm like, oh, at first it's because I saw this, this report on the news that, that showed all the statistics and showed a family that was struggling. Then I dig a little deeper, and it's actually more personal than that. It is when I grabbed the mail from the mailbox and went to pick up my kids, um, and I was waiting for them to get out of school, and I started opening my mail, and I just, you know, I see something from my insurance, didn't think much of it. I open the mail, and I see a bill for $10,000. Everything, even the traffic, felt like it slowed down, felt like birds were chirping slower, felt like I couldn't even see the faces of my kids because I was so overwhelmed. Like, how will this infect all of our futures, right? That is different than saying, I received a really expensive bill that made me mad. So we really want to show and practice painting those pictures because we're all human and stories are compelling. Next slide, please. Okay. Um, to give you a sneak peek into our next um, kind of advocacy skills training, again, at the end of March. In that training, we'll go through in much more depth um, the last set of questions, and we'll also learn the public narrative framework, which is used by all sorts of public advocates, um, organizers, and politicians. And you'll learn how that's used and how to craft your own. Your own. Um, and also it's important to name that learning to craft your, your story, your public narrative, is a practice. It's done continually. I mean, again, a lot of politicians do this, and, and part of their work is to continually revisit their public narrative to explain why they're doing this work. And so that's it for story itself, more of a teaser, um, and a lot of self-reflection. But from here, um, to close out in the last couple of minutes, we will take some questions. All right, great. Thank you, um, Julian, for sharing your story. Um, it's it's not always um, easy to do, and I know we all appreciated you staying so late that night at at the uh, general assembly last. I think it was last February. It was just about a year ago, wasn't it? Um, so. I just put a link in the chat for our next uh, Bring Our Neighbors Home Immigration Policies, which is next week. And I'm not remembering the date. So Julian, pop on and tell me when that is. <laughs> March 2nd, so Tuesday, March 2nd at noon. Thank you, Julian. Um, we also have a, um, another webinar coming up, which is kind of unique. And I hope that link works. It looks a little weird. Um, I apologize. And our new ED is starting on Monday. We are all very excited. And uh, you can join us for a Meet the ED webinar. Um, again, I'm not 100% sure if that link is good, but, and I believe that's on March 10th. Julian, do you remember? I like putting Julian on the spot. He'll look it up for me. But anyways, um, we hope you enjoyed tonight. What I would like to know is, are there any questions that we can answer before we um, let you enjoy the rest of your evening? You can start working on your story of self if you like. Uh, well, um, how do you predict um, bills that are destined to die versus ones that stand a chance? Um, so, I think sometimes you just look at the makeup of the legislature and you look at who might be introducing the bill and um, that. So a lot of Republican bills are going to die. It's just, I'm just going to be honest. Not all of them, but some. Um, some of the um, 
uh, like egregious abortion bills, the personhood bills, those things, they're going to die. Um, but you can't always predict. I mean, sometimes we're like, we think something's going to go through and it, it dies. And sometimes we think something is going to die and it goes through. So you can't always predict, but you know, if it's a big, um, uh, if it's a big thing for the other side and one side's in, eh, might not do so well. Anyways, that's, that's how I would tell. Um, will the chat be emailed or just the links? Um, we can see if we can email the chat. This is the first time we've done a, uh, one of our presentations in meeting format. So we're not 100% sure how to do everything. Does it make a difference how many sponsors are on it? I'll tell you what does make a difference. If you have sponsors from both parties, we try very hard at the ACLU to um, work on bills that are sponsored you know, by Republicans and Democrats. We are nonpartisan. A lot of our um, bills are really, you know, nonpartisan bills. So um, that makes it really important if there are sponsors from both sides of the aisle, as they call it. Um, and the more sponsors, the better. Um, okay, I'm looking for other questions. Oh, you can save the chat by clicking on the three dots to the right of the file, saves the file to your computer. There you go. Thank you, Terry. Terry, right. I may have disabled that feature, just to be honest, but I don't know. I was just messing around with the features. So if you can't, then it's, we'll find a way to send it to you. Yeah. We're, um, yeah, we'll send you a bunch of a bunch of links, and you'll have emails for all of us and and uh, all the all the, the events we're talking about. And what is the date and time for the in depth training at the end of the month? We don't know yet. Um, <laughs> so we are currently working through that, but we will. All of you who are here tonight will get a special email, and anybody who signed up for this will get an email too, even if they couldn't make it. Uh, we did have one more question. Sure. Um, when we have when we have our story of self in writing for a particular issue, is it best to send that to our legislators? How, where can that com be communicated best? Well, Julian, you um, did a great story of self last year. So, what do you think? So, yes, I mean, I think that Caroline, um, it's going to depend on kind of some of the things I was talking about, like for this particular legislator, you might want to do a little research, you know, are they going to be responsive? Um, um, are they, do they serve on a particular committee? Um, and do you want to show up to that committee hearing and share your story face to face with them? Do you want to go visit them at their office? Do you want to not have to see them? You want to just send an email um, and make sure that they um, hear your story. That's a great way as well. You can leave a phone call, uh, leave a message. Um, it's kind of going to be about what you feel most comfortable with, especially if it's a personal story um, or if you're trying to like build momentum around that particular issue, you might want to do a little bit more like, is there an organization that's working on this issue? Um, are there people that can go with me and, and tell their story as well? I hope right. that answers your question, but we're also, um, like we mentioned, we're going to go into depth more later this month um, to talk deeper about the storytelling process um, and putting your story together. We also, you know, this is a, a big overview, but we hope to offer more trainings to you all. Um, you know, our lobby day is gonna go even deeper. We're gonna actually practice lobbying our legislators. So um, yeah, just keep an eye out for some other trainings and feel free to let us know if there's something you're really wanting to know um, from us and how we can support you. Thank you so much, Julian. Um, are the stories done online at this time due to the virus? Yeah, um, right now due to the virus, I highly suggest that you um, either email or maybe try and set up a Zoom meeting. One thing we were doing was um, a while back when we actually went to the Capitol, um, we would record our conversation with the aide and email that to the actual representative or senator, because a lot of times when you're at the Capitol and you're trying to track them down there in committee meetings, you don't actually get to talk to them. You have to talk to their aides. So you could make a short video, email it to them. 
Um, you could do like Julian said, you could just send an email um, or you could show up in a committee hearing. And by show up right now, I mean, you know, virtually. Um, we don't want to encourage anybody to go there at this time because, you know, although it feels like there's a light at the end of the tun tunnel, we are still in a pandemic. All right, any other questions? All right, well, it was so great. This was such a great training. I wanna thank everybody on the campaigns team and thank you all for spending this evening with us. Um, we will be in touch via email. You can also check out our Advocacy at Home webpage and we have lots of our uh, previous trainings on there, um, lots of Jessica's webinars about racial justice and we hope you'll check them all out. So thanks everyone, have a wonderful evening.